Hello and uh, good morning. Welcome to our special coverage of uh, the war in Ukraine. I'm Aladi Akari Duluali, the headlines. UN Chief Antonio Guterres condemns suicidal shelling around Ukrainian nuclear power plant. Pentagon announces extra $1 billion in security assistance for Ukraine. And the Razzoni seeks another port as initial buyer refuses Ukrainian grain, citing five-month delay. begin this morning with news that Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has called for a stronger international response to Russia in what he described as an increased threat of nuclear disaster after shelling at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the biggest in Europe. In his nightly address, Mr. Zelensky said new sanctions were needed, including on Russia's nuclear industry. Both sides have traded blames for the shelling at the power plant amidst international alarm that their battle for control could trigger catastrophe. Russia's invading forces seized the southern Ukrainian region containing Zaporizhia in March when the site was struck without damage to its reactors. The area, including the city of Kherson, is now the target of a Ukrainian counter-offensive. Ukraine appealed for the area around the complex to be demilitarized and for the International Atomic Energy Agency, the UN's nuclear watchdog, to be let in. Russia said it too favored an IAEA visit, which it accused Ukraine of blocking while trying to take Europe hostage by shelling the plant. Ukraine blamed Russia for weekend attacks around the complex, which is still being done by Ukrainian technicians. It said three radiation sensors were damaged and two workers injured by shrapnel. After this Russian war against Ukraine, there should be no smoldering of frozen conflict. It is an important conclusion. Ukraine must regain everything Russia has temporarily captured, and the aggressor states must receive punishment for the crimes of aggression. And it is important not only for justice, only the apparent defeat of the aggressor, its loss of everything captured, and its international legal responsibility for the aggression are a safeguard against any war. We are actively informing the world about Russian nuclear blackmail, about the shelling and mining of Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. There are already appropriate reactions from the international community, but it is necessary to speed up actions in response. Russia will not consider words and worries. New sanctions are needed against the terrorist state and the entire Russian nuclear industry for creating the threat of a nuclear disaster. The world should not forget about Chernobyl. And remember that Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is the largest in Europe. The Chernobyl disaster is an explosion in one reactor. Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is six power units. Meanwhile, Russia's defense ministry has continued uh, with the rhetoric about Ukrainian forces shelling the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and damaging high-voltage power lines and forcing the plant to reduce its output. During a daily military briefing, uh, the ministry said Ukraine had shelled the power station around 12.40 p.m. from positions near the town of Moharnitz. Kiev has, of course, denied attacking the plant, and the country's nuclear power company, Enogatom, says a worker was wounded when Russian forces shelled the power station on Saturday. And more reactions on the shelling of the power plant. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has described recent artillery and rocket fire around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in central Ukraine as suicidal, further adding to fears of an accident at the plant, which is the largest of its kind in Europe. The plant occupies an extensive site on the Dnipro River. It has continued operating at reduced capacity since Russian forces captured it early in March with Ukrainian technicians remaining at work.
and staying with that story, the head of Ukraine's state nuclear power company, Energatom, is calling for the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant to be made a military-free zone, warning of the risk of a Chernobyl-style nuclear disaster after the site was hit by shelling. He called for Russian troops to leave the station in comments on television after Ukraine and Russia accused each other of shelling the nuclear power plant, which lies in Russian-controlled southern Ukraine. Russian forces captured the plant in March, shortly after Moscow began its invasion uh, of its neighbor. And the permanent representative of Ukraine to the international organizations in Vienna, Jewishnet Zimbaljuk, has warned of possible dangerous consequences from the occupied Ukrainian nuclear power plant. International alarm has continued to rise over shelling on Zaporizhia, which gave warning of a Chernobyl style catastrophe and appealing for the area to be made a demilitarized zone. On the evening of August, uh, on 6 August uh, uh, 2022, the Russian armed forces fired rockets at Enerhadar city, also hitting the Zaporizhia NPP uh, site directly next to uh, the dry storage of spent uh, nuclear fuel. Very dangerous. Apparently, they aimed uh, specifically um, at the casks uh, with uh, spent uh, fuel which are stored uh, in the open uh, uh, near the site uh, of uh, shelling. Currently, there are 174 casks there, each containing 24 assemblies of spent nuclear fuel. Can you imagine a potential disaster? Um, as a result, uh, three radiation monitoring sensors around the storage site were damaged due to shelling. Therefore, timely detection and response in case of deterioration of the radi radiation situation or leakage of uh, radiation from containers of spent nuclear fuel, just to repeat that this is the biggest power station in, in, in Europe, a uh, nuclear power station in, in Europe. And uh, if something happens, so there will be uh, huge consequences, not only for Ukraine, uh, probably all Ukraine will be uh, contaminated, uh, but for Europe as well. And staying with nuclear issues, Moscow has informed Washington of a temporary withdrawal from the inspection regime under the START Nuclear Disarmament Treaty. Citing provisions in the document for exceptional circumstances, Russia claims Western sanctions have prevented its inspectors from performing their duties, thus giving their U.S. counterparts an unfair advantage. Once the principle of parity and equality is restored, the previous arrangements will resume, according to the statement. Moscow cited anti-Russian unilateral restrictive measures imposed by the U.S. and its allies, such as visa restrictions on Russian inspectors and a ban on Russian aircraft in U.S. and EU airspace. These restrictions effectively make Russian inspections under the treaty impossible, while the Americans do not experience such difficulties. Let's talk now to Associate Professor of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Cambridge, uh, Rory Finnin. He joins us uh, from uh, New York. Good morning to you, Rory. Thank you for your time. Good morning. Nice to be with you. Let's, uh, let's start with what we've been uh, reporting uh, most recently, the very latest, uh, which is Russia withdrawing from the START nuclear disarmament uh, treaty, and it's given its reasons. Uh, do you think perhaps we are now on a slippery slope to some form of a really big catastrophe? I think we've been on this slippery slope um, for many years, and we're particularly on it since the 24th of February. One thing to keep in mind with respect to the threats now to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which again, to your viewers, just to remind you, is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe with six different reactors. One thing to remember is that in, in February and March, if you recall, Russian troops also uh, occupied the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which is the site of the worst nuclear disaster uh, in history of 1986. Um, we had reports of Russian troops digging around the site, many of them actually getting sick with radiation poisoning 
um, showing complete disregard, exhibiting total recklessness with respect to a very sensitive nuclear site of Chernobyl. We're seeing the same thing now with Russian forces militarizing this particular site. So we are absolutely on this slippery slope. And one thing that we need to take into context here is not only the dangers that we face with Russia's militarization of this power plant, but also the, the kind of general terrorism um, that militarizing this nuclear power plant, uh, power plant represents. That is, it is causing massive fear, not only in Ukraine, but across Europe and indeed the world. And that's part of the point here as well. It's to um, uh, create a kind of blackmail scenario in which uh, Russia holds us to ransom with fear that the, something catastrophic can happen. Let's, uh, let's look at uh, something else that is also uh, a fly in the ointment, if you will. Uh, the, the grain deal, which has been praised because, uh, as at uh, yesterday, 10 ships had been loaded with various uh, 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 foodstuff and uh, departing for various locations. The very first one, which was due to go to uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, has now been diverted because the original buyer uh, has refused to take it. He says uh, it, the, the shelf life is now much shorter and there's a five-month delay, so he doesn't want it anymore. Uh, could this be a template for others who had, uh, who had ordered grain, uh, which is now just being shipped? I think so. And let's step back and realize this is a food crisis of global proportions that has been brought on by Russian aggression against Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian farmers fighting to harvest, to till their soil, risking their lives to do so. And we have uh, repeated reports of Russian troops firing on um, uh, farms, firing on fields to deliberately cause an incineration of the wheat crop, uh, coupled with what you've mentioned here um, are um, various attempts to undermine the export of grain from Ukraine, the safe export. Um, and that has led to, as you just mentioned, um, a lot of international trade um, problems that are causing real concerns for hunger uh, around the world. Um, all of it due to Russian aggression against Ukraine and this kind of general terrorism um, that the Kremlin has decided to, um, to, to project around the world. Let's, uh, let's look at something else, shall we? Uh, the, the United States has received uh, international praise for its leadership uh, of the coalition in support of Ukraine against uh, uh, this Russian invasion. But it does look as if uh, it might have uh, gone to poke another bear uh, with what happened uh, in Taiwan and what China is now seizing upon uh, to uh, really ratchet up tension in that area. Uh, the United States uh, House Speaker was in Taipei uh, uh, just uh, last week uh, towards uh, strengthening ties. And then now we're also having reports that um, on the disputed border between India and China, uh, the U.S. intends to participate in military drills with India. Uh, are these not risking possibly taking international attention away from what is happening in Ukraine and possibly uh, uh, allowing for untoward things to actually happen there. I agree with you in this respect. I really do. I think the timing is extremely unfortunate. I think our, our global attention needs to be focused on Ukraine. I'm particularly uh, pleased that Channel's television has done so repeatedly and continues to do so um, because this threat is so severe, not only to Europe, but to the entire world. And when we see these other geopolitical hotspots um, being provoked um, in various ways by the United States, by others, I do think it takes um, our attention away from what is clearly a, 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 a present danger for us all with respect to Russia's aggression against Ukraine. So I, I do think that um, focusing on ways that we can support Ukrainians, uh, the Ukrainian military, these are the things that we should be focused on. We should also be clear about uh, the intentions here on the part of the Kremlin. Um, sometimes we are caught up in these, uh, these narratives about NATO, uh, international geopolitics, this is a clear campaign by a former empire to reclaim former territory of that empire. It is an, it's a war of aggression and conquest. Um, and that is uh, at the center of uh, the biggest crisis in Europe 
for, for many years. And so the extent to which we can all focus on that um, and not be looking um, to uh, make a geopolitical situation around the globe much worse. I think that's the, that's the recipe going forward, is to focus our attention on Ukraine. Uh, this, this has also uh, complicated matters in the sense that uh, all the, what happened in Taiwan and China's reaction was happening at the same time as Ukraine was asking China uh, to prevail on Russia uh, uh, to uh, uh, stop this invasion and withdraw. Uh, of course, China is now preoccupied with its own uh, reaction. But let's return, as you say, to the war in Ukraine. It does appear also that the EU... Uh, uh, is uh, somewhat now preoccupied with the aftermath of its initial reaction, uh, the various sanctions that it had imposed, particularly with respect to energy supplies and the spiral on effect that that is having on economic uh, policy and economic development in, uh, in many of those areas. How do you think they're navigating this? Uh, are they likely, for example, to push Ukraine down the agenda in the individual countries? I think we finally reached that moment of so-called Ukraine fatigue in Europe. It's been something I've been dreading for a very long time. Um, I think it's really Russia fatigue, first of all. Um, I do think that the, the situation in the EU is very complex, and we need to talk about individual uh, member states. <clears throat> we can find some things to credit Germany with in terms of arms provision of the past week or two. Um, but I do think... Um, the role of France and Germany in seeking, in some respects, uh, a, a set of compromises in which Ukraine gives up something. I think it's an extremely dangerous scenario. Um, the UK, for instance, has been leading the charge in Europe, I do believe, in terms of providing um, uh, military support and financial support for Ukraine. So I hope that that is the, the logic that prevails and that the, um, the, the reticence among some European leaders in the EU to acknowledge the dangers that Russia presents to us. No one wanted to confront Russia in this way, but the truth of the matter is, for a decade now, Russian Federation has been talking about a war with the West. And now this war has come to Europe. Um, we need to, uh, to fight it. We need to support Ukraine with weapons and uh, financial assistance uh, and, and to not lose focus on the dangers that Russian aggression presents, not only to the continent, but to the entire world. Um, if we surrender to this logic of might makes right, we return to a very dangerous time, time that we see um, in many places in the world. So um, that kind of focus from EU leaders needs to be maintained I worry it's slipping a bit, but I do believe that um, there are enough leaders in places like the UK and deep in the US to keep that pressure on. Uh, before I let you go, uh, Rory, I, I have to ask, is there a danger here of this crisis? Uh, we've talked about, of course, uh, the Chinese and Taiwan and all of that uh, geopolitics, but it does seem as if, uh, if not the conflict yet, uh, but at least the geopolitics is spreading to Africa. Sergei Lavrov was here, Emmanuel Macron was in Africa uh, uh, as we speak, Anthony Blinken is in Africa, uh, and it does seem as if there is a, a kind of uh, fight for influence uh, among the countries uh, uh, on the continent. Do you think that this could draw in countries that possibly are not prepared, do not have the wherewithal to participate in this geopolitics, and somewhere along the lines that this could precipitate a crisis uh, uh, even on this continent itself that will have everyone scrambling? I, I, I pray not, um, but I think you're absolutely right that um, uh, the world has really focused on the African continent uh, for a number of reasons. Um, Lavrov's charm offensive uh, was extremely manipulative. Um, they've been making plays in, in Africa for quite some time. Um, and I think the West has been not really paying attention and not taking them seriously enough. And so that's why you see Blinken and others reacting in the way that they, they are. I do fear that this is a war, um, particularly if we think back to 1939 in Europe, if one looks through um, articles of the New York Times, you see how the war unfolds um, over the course of those weeks and, and months in the autumn of 1939 and how uh, in, in, in early 1940 it begins to engulf the entire world. It seems like it's constrained between 
let's say, Germany and that invasion of Poland, but things spiral out of control quite quickly in ways that we can never anticipate. Um, and so that's why we need to be as aggressive as we can now, rather than resorting to half measures, which only continue um, uh, to, to, to push the war into the future, to make it a war of attrition. That's something we need to avoid precisely so that it does not spill out of control into different uh, continents around the globe. Professor Rory Finning uh, joining us uh, from uh, New York. Thank you for your perspective and time this morning. Uh, and do continue to stay safe. Thank you. You too. And after the break, uh, EU energy companies complain of radioactive elements in UK gas exports. Details in a moment. Please stay on with us. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back. The Ukrainian embassy in Lebanon has reported that the Rizzoni, the first ship to depart Ukraine under a UN broker deal, is looking for another port to unload its grain cargo as the initial Lebanese buyer has refused delivery, citing more than a five month delay. The embassy said in a FSCE book report according to the information provided by the shipper of the Ukrainian grain aboard the Rizzoni, the buyer in Lebanon refused to accept the cargo due to delays in delivery terms. The Rizzoni left Odessa last week carrying 26,527 tons of corn. The ship was scheduled to arrive in Lebanon on Sunday, but it changed its destination to Turkey's Mersin port and is currently at anchor off Turkey's southern coast, according to Refinitive Ship Tracker data. The United Nations and Turkey brokered the agreement last month after warnings that the halting Ukrainian grain shipments caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine could lead to to severe food shortages and even outbreaks of farming in parts of the world. According to data from Turkey's defense ministry so far, around 243,000 tons of corn has been exported from Ukraine on seven ships since the first departure on August of the 1st. And speaking about that, the Turkish flagged bulk carrier Polonet has arrived at the northern port in Turkey three days after leaving Ukraine. The ship was carrying 12,000 tons of corn from Astronomosk docked to Durant's port located in the Black Sea. The ship is expected to unload uh, its cargo at the port later on today. The shipment is, of course, coming a couple of weeks after Russia and Ukraine signed a deal brokered by the United Nations and Turkey after warnings that the halt in grain ship shipments caused by the conflict could lead to severe food shortages and even outbreaks. The resumption of grain export is being overseen by the JCC in Istanbul, where Ukrainian, Turkish and UN personnel are working. And the U.S. Department of Defense has announced its largest military aid package for Kiev since the Russia-Ukraine conflict began in February, adding an additional $1 billion in weapons shipments to the former Soviet Republic. The latest batch of weaponry was approved under President Joe Biden's drawdown authority, which the Pentagon says is the 18th such package for Ukraine. It will include more ammunition for the high-mobility artillery rocket systems launches that the U.S. previously sent to Ukraine as well as a 1,000 Javelin anti-tank missiles, C4 explosives, Claymore anti-personnel mines, and tens of thousands of artillery and anti-aircraft rounds. The Pentagon also plans to provide 50 armored medical treatment vehicles, plus more pallets of medical supplies and equipment. Mr. Biden has now approved about $9.8 billion in military aid to Kiev since he took office in January of 2021, including $9 billion since Russian tanks rolled across Ukraine's borders. Congress approved $40 billion in overall new aid to Ukraine in May, after previously providing $13.6 billion. Ukrainian officials have touted the effectiveness of the U.S.-made HEMAS system, calling it a game-changer on the battlefield. However, the Russian Defense Ministry has claimed to have destroyed six of the 16 that the U.S. has sent to Ukraine, as well as ammunition uh, stockpiles. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov will lead the Russian delegation to the U.N. General Assembly scheduled for the end of September in New York. Uh, the Kremlin has announced uh, President Vladimir Putin does not intend to travel to the U.N. General Assembly or even address the event online. 
it is unclear whether the U.S. will allow Mr. Lavrov and another member of the delegation to enter the country even for the UN event. There are no plans for Mr. Putin to travel to the US or address the world body, and that's according to Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesman. Instead, the Russian president signed a directive designating Sergei Lavrov as the head of the, U, uh, the Russian delegation. He'll be accompanied by Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Vashinin and Russian permanent representative to the UN, Vasily Nebenzia, as well as Senator Grigory Karasin, and Duma Deputy Leonid Shlutsky, who chairs the Foreign Affairs Committee of the respective parliamentary chambers. The U.S. government sanctioned Slutsky in March over his support for crime, uh, Crimea rejoining Russia. Mr. Lavrov was added to the sanctions list on February 25, as Washington accused him of being directly responsible for uh, Russia's unprovoked and unlawful further invasion of Ukraine. Russia has dismissed the embargo by the U.S. and its allies as unilateral and illegitimate. The head of Germany's right-wing alternative for Germany AFD party, Alice Weidel, has named what she believes to be the West's mistake with respect to Ukraine. According to the politician, Kiev's allies should have fostered an image for the Eastern European nation as a neutral state instead of trying to drag it into NATO or the EU. In an interview, Ms. Weidel was asked to explain why some members of the AFD have been offering justifications for Russia's offensive against Ukraine or have even been spreading Kremlin propaganda. That's a quote. The AFD parliamentarian of faction had replied that in our party and faction, it is undisputed that what we are seeing is an aggressive war by Russia against Ukraine that is absolutely against international law. She however noted that when talking about today's conflict in the Eastern European nation, one has to keep in mind the historical background leading to the current events. According to her, Moscow has always made it clear that it will not accept an adversarial power in its backyard, adding that Ukraine has been a red line for decades for Russia. The AFD uh, faction chief went on to argue that the West has handled this highly sensitive issue recklessly and made a mistake by not setting Ukraine on a course towards becoming a neutral country. She emphasized that her party sees the current conflict in Ukraine as extremely dangerous, not least for Germany, which is not as far away from the battlefield as the United States is. Let's talk now to uh, Chidi Warno, uh, Director, Peckavy Consulting Limited, joins us uh, from the British capital, uh, London. Good morning to you, Chidi. Thank you for your time this morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Let's, uh, let, let, let's look at some of these uh, developments, shall we? Uh, another billion dollars in aid. Uh, the U.S. is not letting up on this, even though uh, it has uh, quite a lot on its plate right now. Uh, but I want to find out from you, do you think uh, it's going to poke another bear in, uh, by, uh, by Nancy Pelosi's visit uh, to Taiwan uh, and riling up China? Well, it's, it's an interesting, people have made this comparison and it's an interesting one. I, I think it's less poking another bear and more the United States maybe trying to regain the strategic initiative for itself. I mean, there's a lot of conspiracy theories about, or not maybe conspiracy theories, there's a lot of theories about why Nancy Pelosi decided to go to Taiwan at this point in time. But it's, it's clear throughout the presidencies of President Obama, President Trump, and now to President Biden that the Asia Pacific has been uh, America's main focus. And what I think the big fear in America is that uh, China is maybe learning the wrong lessons from the war in Ukraine. They're thinking that maybe, uh, you know, a short, sharp conventional war to, to resolve their issues might, um, might be what they need. So this is a, a very useful tool for the Americans to um, remind the Chinese that they, they have a vote in this. And also, you know, another thing which maybe... Uh, um, I don't know how to put it, like from an operational level, with the Chinese flying their jets, putting their ships out there, firing off their rockets, it's a beautiful um, intelligence opportunity for the Americans because they can see where the rockets have been launched from, where the planes have been launched from. They can, you know, uh, tap into Chinese radio signals. They can take, uh, you know, uh, read their radio, radar signatures. So it's a great intelligence uh, uh, kind of collecting opportunity for them, as well as a strategic kind of message to China. And China will also have to understand that if it does go to war, it will be tanking the global economy, which China itself de depends on. So it's just, in my opinion, 
a larger part of the geopolitical theater that you know the world is going through. I don't think it's necessarily provoking another war, but it is, as long as there are no miscalculations, it is just another kind of move on the chessboard for, for each side to you know, set out their stages. Let's, uh, let's look at uh, something else involved in all of this, and, and, and that's this uh, nuclear power plant, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. There's been a lot of buzz about this. Uh, there's been reported shelling. Who is doing the shelling uh, is a bone of contention. The Russians say the Ukrainians are, even though the Russians are in control of the plant, but there are Ukrainian technicians there. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, uh, are saying it's the Russians uh, who are shelling the plant. But whoever is shelling the plant seems to be preparing the grounds for a major uh, catastrophe. Uh, some of the reports that one has seen uh, points out that Chernobyl, uh, which was the site of the 1986 disaster, is not too far uh, from uh, this site. Yeah, so this is, uh, again, one of the other um, problems of this war is, is the amount of critical infrastructure that is not just uh, being turned into a military object, but, you know, seen a fighting. It, 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 we can't say who's actually shelling the plant. It's, it's really difficult to, to, to put a kind of blame or, or, or on, on, any, on any party for the simple reason that both sides have an interest in shelling that plant. The, the Ukrainians need to recapture it, and they also want to, you know, threaten the, the Russians that are there. The Russians would like to um, blacken the Ukrainians' name and say that they're the ones who are creating a problem there. The key thing is that a nuclear power plant or any sort of infrastructure that, such as that should not be a military object. People should not go near it for this, for this very reason. It becomes, you know, um, it becomes a military target. If there are, is, there are many, um, because these designs are old Soviet designs, they're not modern designs, there's a lot of uh, parts of, of, the, of the system that can fail. And this is where the fear is that it's not one of the modern uh, kind of reactors that has inbuilt kind of fail safes. If something goes wrong, if the technicians, you know, uh, are injured or killed and are withdrawn, it could lead to a meltdown and a Chernobyl style uh, accident. It's, it's still quite unlikely, but it's one of the risks that, um, that, that you know, come out from this. But is it, is it practical, do you think, I mean, from a security perspective, as you say, both sides have a, an interest in shelling that plant. Uh, one way or the other. But is it practical to talk about demilitarizing the zone around the plant? Uh, we do know that, I mean, there's fighting going on in Kherson. The Ukrainians are planning a counteroffensive in the general area uh, following the Russians' capture of it. So is it feasible to talk about demilitarizing the area and allowing IAEA inspectors into the plant who can then neutrally say uh, if someone is doing something wrong and who is yeah, it, that would be the best course of action but this is an active conflict if the russians withdraw from the plants uh and the ukrainians and the ukrainians capture the area they're naturally going to reoccupy the plant so for the russian from a russian point of view they're just handing over grounds to the to the ukrainians that they don't need that you know they'd rather the ukrainians fought for but from the ukrainian point of view they're obviously thinking well it's our territory we need to recapture it so we, we have to fight for it but logically, both sides should agree that they're going to demilitarize um, all the nuclear areas, uh, put an exclusion zone around them, and try and avoid them as much as possible. As I said, the problem is, in each of these localities, that will benefit one side more than the other, and that's going to be where the sticking point is. And because there is a certain uh, element of distrust, a, loss, a large element of distrust between both sides, and the IAEA you know, doesn't necessarily have any enforcement powers you know, when it comes to a war, uh, it's going to be very difficult to, to enforce. What I think you're more likely to see is interested powers. So once again, the people like the Turks, the Chinese, may be coming in at some point and trying to negotiate something around these uh, power plants. Let me bring you to where you are. Uh, you are in the British capital there, and uh, Britain has taken a lead in all of this. Uh, my previous guest highlighted that when he said, uh, you know, Britain had, uh, uh, had taken on a significant training of Ukrainian uh, military forces. There's the Ukrainian home scheme offering uh, 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 asylum and uh, refugee status uh, to Ukrainians fleeing the conflict. But there's been a price, which is in the energy sector, particularly where you have high energy prices. Some of the estimates uh, that I've seen talk about perhaps up to 300 pounds per household uh, by the time this year is over. And yet, 
Britain itself uh, uh, seems to have its own economic uh, problems. Uh, one of the stories we, we had this morning talks about uh, British gas having radioactive elements. Now, do you see in the middle of the leadership tussle uh, as to who becomes the next British Prime Minister, do you see this Ukrainian war uh, featuring prominently, especially because of its spiral on effect, or has it dropped down, as someone I spoke to said, uh, to number six on the, uh, on the list of items that Britons, uh, Britons are concerned about? So that, that's, that's a very, exactly the issue. That's entirely correct in that. And this is part of the problem we have with this leadership debate. It's very shallow. It's very, um, it's, it's talking about things that, you know, that are maybe of interest to a, f a niche few people in within the Conservative Party. And uh, it's not the, the only person, I mean, without, you know, taking sides, you know, there, there are very few um, conversations that are taking place about in, within the leadership debate that are about the deeper strategic problems. And the deepest, the biggest strategic problem that the United Kingdom has now, obviously, is that even though we're not dependent on energy from Russia, the rest of the world is, and that creates this um, kind of concertina effects of uh, high prices, you know, restriction of demand and then high prices. It affects our economy, even though we're independent of Russian um, um, influence because we are, we have our own gas from the North Sea. Uh, and at the same time, when we're talking about, you've mentioned support to Ukraine. Now we are training lots of Ukrainian troops for supplying them with equipment, with intelligence in all sorts of assistance, but our own military is, is greatly depleted. Yeah, you know, the army that I joined is not the army we've got today. The army we've got today could barely fill Wembley Stadium. Um, you know, when I joined the British Army, the British Army was in operation in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Northern Ireland. A few years later, they went on and conducted operations in Syria alone, went to the, uh, Iraq and then Afghanistan. There's no way the British Army today could, could even conceivably do anything like the Syria alone operation. It's too small. Um, it doesn't have, you know, the right enabling uh, of kind of actors like, um, you know, the right logistics. Um, we don't even have armor, long range artillery, uh, air defense, all of these things. And this is something that's deeply irritating to people like me. It's not being discussed at all during the leadership debate. There is no uh, discussion about rearming the UK and building back our defense industries, building back the military. It's all uh, fluff. Anyone who mentions Ukraine, it's just, we're going to support Ukraine, but just, you know, they don't go to the next stage, which is by saying, we're going to do it by rebuilding our military or increasing our defense industry. So there is, a, there is a problem in store that's going to be waiting for the United Kingdom, you know, um, after this. And as I said, you know, I think the last time we spoke, this winter is going to be decisive in terms of not just the economic impact, but the military impact. And if Russia, and if th this winter isn't favorable to Russia, as in they, they suffer a series of defeats and in desperation decide to escalate the war, maybe to the Baltics or Finland or Sweden, Britain will be found wanting because we don't have the military capacity to respond in any way, shape or form other than the rhetoric. That's, that's something to really think about there. Uh, Chidi Water, thank you so much uh, for your time uh, and do continue to stay safe. We'll, as always, uh, get back to you a little bit later on as the developments unfold in what has turned out to be a protracted battle. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. EU energy companies have complained that the liquefied natural gas processed in the United Kingdom for export to the bloc has toxic and hazardous contaminants and urge London to rectify the situation. The UK processes large volumes of LNG coming mainly from the US and Qatar and then exports the gas via subsea pipelines to Belgium and the Netherlands. As EU countries have been trying to fill up their gas storages amidst the drop in supplies from Russia, the UK has become a vital alternative source. However, according to the report, several energy companies said in recent months, gas delivered to UK terminals has often been contaminated with radioactive elements. The companies that reported these findings include Belgian infrastructure giant Fluxis, Germany's Securing Energy for Europe, former Gazprom Germania, and French utility EDF. They have collectively urged the UK's National Grid to take urgent action to fix the problem. National Grid has reportedly recently applied to UK energy regulator Ofgen to temporarily increase the volume of gas exports to mainland Europe via the pipeline to the Netherlands. However, Interconnector Limited, which operates the gas pipeline between the UK and Belgium, said it was surprised by the plan as supplies this year have consistently been contaminated and caused two shutdowns at the pipelines for repair. 
Wheat and corn prices dropped yesterday on news that the first grain ship from Ukraine reached their destinations and met expectations that restrictions on Russian agricultural exports will also be eased. Prices have been steadily declining ever since the moscow Kiev deal on grain exports brokered by Turkey and the UN was signed last month. Russia and Ukraine are considered the bread baskets of the world, accounting for nearly a third of the global grain supply. The deal set out a framework for resuming Ukrainian grain exports from Black Sea ports, which had been blocked for months due to the Russia-Ukraine conflict. In addition, Moscow and the UN signed a memorandum stipulating UN involvement in lifting restrictions on the exports of Russian grain and fertilizers to the world markets. And coming up after the break, American actress Jessica Sheston visits children in Kiev Hospital. Please stay on with us. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back to uh, the program. Yes, Ine is here, uh, as always, at uh, this time, <laughs> or around this time. About morning this time. to Good you, Ine John Mekwa. Uh, the Russian stocks are getting a reprieve. Mm -hmm. Why? So, um, um, one of the things that the government, the Russian government, did to protect its economy was that they stopped, especially non residents from unfriendly countries, from trading in the Moscow exchange. Right. So, uh, because of course, you would expect that with all that is happening, a lot of people would just want to dump their stocks, stocks and get out. And get out. So, because of that, they stopped. So, the only people who could trade were residents inside Russia, uh, Russians inside Russia who could do that. So, there was an announcement on Friday to say, oh, after six months or so of the war, maybe they thought everything is calm and we know the ruble is doing well, so that um, people who are not in Russia, non-residents in Russia, who are engaged, who have uh, invested in the Moscow Exchange, that they could trade. trade right. So everyone was obviously waiting for uh, a terrible day. In fact, some people call it a crash of the Moscow Exchange yesterday, Monday. Uh, I, I, and I think that the government also sensed it. So at the end of the day, just when uh, the market was about to open, they tweaked that directive to say, oh, it's not not the exchange is actually for commodities derivatives only. <laughs> they, they never, they never cease to be so, very quick with this thing. Because I mean, I think everyone, a lot of people, not everyone, a lot of people who are not resident, and especially those from the unfriendly countries, Absolutely. were getting ready to dump their shares yesterday to ensure that they just leave them. Because we don't know what's going to be the future of the investments. Let's just leave. Even if we lose some money, at least we will still get part of it. Part of it and back. then there were. Also also conversations that some of these people were also going to people from unfriendly countries were going to go through the people in friendly countries to sell off their shares so when that thing happened when the instruction or the directive was tweaked and then uh, <laughs> the market uh, and the ruble and everybody just got a little bit of reprieve well, you know when you okay, just fine. <sighs> yeah but you breathe out you breathe out you breathe out well now uh, on the other hand uh, there's some tension because the number of Russians who are owing for basic services yes. is up. Yes, it is up uh, because uh because um, even though the government is doing a whole lot, we can't run away from the reality. The reality is that a lot of corporates have left Russia, and those corporates used to employ Russians, a lot of Russians, or at least a lot of residents in Russia. Right. So we find that uh, at the end of the first quarter of 2022, that those owing for housing, those owing for communal services increased by 7.6%. That's about 804.5 billion rubles. Oof. They've not been able to pay because they're out of job, you know. So uh, even though the economy on, on the top is looking so good, the individuals are beginning to feel that crunch. And um, debt to resource supplying organizations have also reported that they are also being owed by 11% of their revenue has been reduced now because uh, a lot of People Russians are, not able, to are not able to. And if if this continues, well, I guess uh, the genius that the Russian government is, they might find a way to offset it. But for now, a lot of people are owing, or at least this number of people are 
owing in Russia. 901 rubles were debts for users of housing and community service. And then the debts of citizens may grow because Indeed. we don't see those jobs uh, coming, coming back to their anytime, and anytime soon. Now, uh, we talked about this in the past, but it now looks like it's going to happen. Mm. Maybe another sign of reprieve mm. uh, for Russia. Turkey and Russia now mm. are going ahead with that. You know, team. yesterday we talked about their close ties and how it right. seems the West is looking the other way. Well, they are taking that tie even further because Turkey has now agreed to be paying parts of their payment for gas. They're going to be paying it in rubles. So that is going to threaten the ruble Rubble, even of more. course, even further. Even further and increase revenue for the country. In fact, I saw a report, but I mean, I think it's still under investigation to say that, that um, their earnings from energy, from gas and oil, that's for Russia, has even gone up. You know, but I think that needs to still be checked out because we do know that even when they are selling, they do they are selling at a cheaper rate compared to what the official uh, rate is globally. And uh, some of those customers, even though people are saying they're buying it indirectly, that when those yes. Indian and Chinese uh, uh, people buy it cheap, they still sell it to the same people who say they don't <laughs> want to deal with Russia because of uh, sanctions and all of that. But indirectly, they are still patronizing so Russia that, and oil right. and gas. But, you know, all those uh, complications in the system. The system the indeed. Ine, thank you. Uh, as always, there'll be more Ine uh, later, uh, as well as Laddie Williams, uh, Business Morning, Business Incorporated. Business Morning's right after this show, so you watch out uh, for that. And then Business Incorporated at 1.30. Thank you for promoting our shows. <laughs> <laughs> th th thank you, for, thank you for, uh, for, for being part of this, uh, this show. Thank you. Let, let, let's take a look at uh, the sports news emanating from this uh, conflict. Jelly Saveta Polyanatska has not been picked in Latvia's team for the Red Mech Gymnastics World Championships because she will not renounce Russian citizenship. Polsiana was born in Latvia but lived and trained in Russia until early this year. The Latvian Olympic Committee had issued an ultimatum that she relinquish Russian citizenship or stop being able to compete for Latvia. The Rhythmic Gymnastics World Championships is scheduled to hold next month in Sofia, Bulgaria. And Turkish football club Fenerbahce have been handed a suspended partial stadium closure order by UEFA after their supporters chanted Russian President Vladimir Putin's name during a Champions League qualifier against Ukrainian side Dynamo Kiev. Uh, European football's governing body launched an investigation after thousands of Fenerbahce supporters chanted Mr. Putin's name during the march on July the 27th when Vitaly Bolyansky opened the scoring for their wayside at the Sukru Suryachovsko Stadium in Istanbul. UFO also finds the club fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And finally, on the program, Hollywood actress and producer Jessica Chastain has paid a visit uh, to Okmati Children's Hospital in the capital, Kiev. Chastain played with children and spoke to their mothers. She also spent time with a girl whose parents died in the conflict. The girl gave her one of the paintings she drew, and Chastain wrote a note for her saying, you are so brave. The Hollywood actress who came to Kiev by train also met uh, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and his chief of staff, Andrew Yermak, before winding up her visit. During the meeting, Mr. Zelensky had thanked the actress for visiting as she praised the people of Ukraine for being very brave and strong. And do you have any... That's our program this morning. Thanks for being with us. My name is Ladi Akiri Tuluali. There's an update within the world today at 5 o'clock. Do watch out for that. But for now, have yourselves a pleasant Tuesday ahead. Good morning.